In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. So today is the, um, is the third Sunday of the Coptic month of Amshir, and it's the third Sunday in a row that we read from the Gospel of St. John. As a matter of fact, it's the th- third Sunday in a row that we read from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. So three Sundays in a row reading from the very, first, from the very same chapter. A very important chapter. John chapter 6 is is also a somewhat long chapter. It's 71 verses long. And last Sunday, if you remember, we read from um, the beginning of the chapter, chapter um, verses 5 through 14, the account of the feeding of the multitudes. Um, The the first Sunday of Amshir, we read from a little bit later on passage, so we didn't read the gospel, uh, chapter 6, in order. Um, We read 5 to 14. Last Sunday we read 22 to 27 the Sunday before, which is an account of Jesus crossing um, the sea, uh, walking on water. And the people who had just seen the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 were looking for him. Today, as you just heard, we read uh, from verses 27 to 46, where Jesus declares that, um, that he is the bread of life. So if you remember from two weeks ago, the crowd were looking for Jesus after the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes. They were amazed by that miracle, so much so that they wanted to make Jesus king. And they went and saw that there was a boat missing and they knew that the disciples had taken the only boat across the sea to the other side. And so they couldn't figure out where Jesus was or or when they did find him on the other side of the sea, they couldn't figure out how he got to the other side of the sea. So they were amazed and when they saw him they said, how did you come here? So now they're amazed because of two things, because they solved the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes, but also now they have another miracle in front of them where they may not have realized that they've they're witnessed the miracle, but there was another miracle of Jesus walking on on water. And Jesus warns them and he and he realizes what they're in what they're why they're seeking him, why they're going after him, and he tells them, You don't seek me because you saw the signs or the miracles, but because you ate of the loaves and are filled. And he continues on with a very important message and warning. He says, don't labor for the food which which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. And that's the beginning of the the passage that we read today. Jesus tells them that they're only looking for him because he fed them before, and that's all they want. But if you remember of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, of the multitudes, that he didn't just feed their body with bread and fish, but he also gave them wonderful words. He fed their minds and their souls with his words. But they're only focused on one thing. They're only focused on their bodies, but they're not focused on their souls and nurturing their souls. And that's what, two things I want to focus on today from, from this sequence and this conversation that Jesus had with the multitudes. The first one is that the crowd, as well as us, need to change our priorities. The crowd was seeking Jesus because what he can give them. They were not seeking Jesus for who he is. And too many people do that. When I'm in trouble or when I'm worried, I'm worried about my job or worried about my business, I pray harder. When I submit an application for a new job or submit an application for a school to accept me, I go to church that much more often. When I have exams coming up or or I'm... I am sick or my loved one has an illness, I become the best Christian ever. When I want something from God, I get closer to Him and I pursue Him more. But when things are peaceful and there's no stress in my life and there's no problems in my life, I don't pray as hard. Maybe I skip church more often. Maybe I don't try as hard to be a Christian. So do I seek Jesus for His own sake, for who He is? Or do I seek Jesus only when I want something from Him? Imagine you're treated like that with your friends. That your friends only came and came after you and approached you when they want something from you. How would you react to your friends? Or would you not think of them as really your true friends? When Jesus fed the multitudes, one of the very important messages that he, that, that for them is they don't need to worry about hunger anymore. They don't need to worry about earthly food anymore. He's providing that for them. Now they can focus on bigger things. They can focus on higher things. They can focus on their eternal food. It's true what they say about a hungry man that you can't preach to a hungry man because he's too worried about his stomach. That's true. But once he's fed, 
That hungry man, now that his belly is full, needs to move on and focus on bigger things, on more important matters than his hunger, because his hunger has been taken care of. What's also amazing is that after all the things that Jesus said to the multitudes and to the, and to the people that followed him and all the miracles that Jesus performed, the crowd today in, the, in their encounter with Jesus still lacks faith and still asks for a miracle. Not only is the, is the crowd looking for a miracle, they're even dictating to Jesus what the miracle is. They're asking for another miracle like the manna in the desert. So many miracles were performed to the Israelites in the wilderness. From the plagues that were, from the ten plagues that were, that were performed on the Egyptians in Egypt, to the parting of the Red Sea, to water coming forth from a rock, from the clothes of the, of the Israelites in the wilderness not even wearing out over the 40 years. But the multitudes are thinking of their stomachs, and only their stomachs. And Jesus is urging, urging them to focus on God, to focus on the true bread, the true giver of the bread. He wants them to know that, that He is their daily bread, that He is the only necessity in their life, that He is the true bread giver, and He gives the bread from heaven that will give them everlasting life. That the manna in the desert that they're so focused on was only a foreshadowing, a pre-telling of a greater gift that will be coming from heaven. Even where Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which in Hebrew means the, the house of bread, is a foreshadowing of him being the true bread from heaven. But that's not what the crowd that followed Jesus wanted to hear. They wanted more miracles like the feeding of the 5,000. They wanted to satisfy their physical hunger and they rebelled against Jesus. And they only saw Jesus as the carpenter from Nazareth who can give them bread and feed their stomachs. And they couldn't see him as somebody, as God, that could meet their every need. They didn't focus, they didn't remember that in the feeding of the, of the, the miracle of the manna in the wilderness for the Israelites, only their physical hunger was met. But Jesus wanted to give them so much more. He wanted to give them bread that when they eat it, they don't become hungry again like physical bread where you become hungry after a few hours. He's offering them spiritual food. He's offering them the Word of God. And in reality, each and every one of us hungers for the spiritual food. Each and every one of us hungers for the Word of God. And that hunger can only be satisfied by God. But unfortunately, the crowd today in front of Jesus just doesn't get it. They want something to eat and that's all they can focus about. They don't realize that they're standing in front of Jesus. They're standing in front of the long-awaited Messiah, in front of God, and all they can think about is their stomachs. They're only focused on themselves, and the only value they can see with their relationship with Jesus is what they can immediately get out of Him, feeding their physical hunger. And they're not focused on anything deeper or anything longer term than that. But it's easy to come down hard on the crowd. It's easy to say, look at and point fingers at the crowd and say they're greedy. They're short-sighted. But I think we should turn our attention on ourselves and say, are we any different than the crowd? If I was there in the crowd today, would I be focused on the bread that Jesus gave, gave the crowd last, the last time they saw him? Or are they focused on the words of Jesus? What would I be focused on? Remember the advice that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 6, not to worry about storing up riches that, that, that rust and deteriorate, that, that thieves can steal? It's important for us to remember that those things are not important. What's important is that God gives and God sustains life. It's an easy trap to think otherwise. When you're hungry, all you can think, of, think about is that loaf of bread that will satisfy your hunger. That loaf of bread looks wonderful. But unfortunately, also while I'm feeling down, the idea of a rich meal becomes so tempting. The idea of buying a beautiful new outfit becomes so tempting. Too many times when I suffer from spiritual hunger, I fill that void, that spiritual hunger, with things, instead of with the true word of God that will satisfy that hunger. And unfortunately, that's exactly what the TV message in television gives me. It tells me that a new car, or expensive jewelry, or a new perfume, or even a beverage, will help me enjoy life more. It will solve all my problems, that those things will, will, will satisfy my hunger. But it doesn't work. I go and get these things and I find myself even hungrier afterwards. 
So yeah, it's too easy. It's very easy to come down on the crowd today and say, look how, how greedy they are and look how short-sighted they are. But we're not any different. The difference is that we're not running after bread the way they're running after bread. We're running after much more expensive things. I don't just simply crave bread. Now I crave luxuries that I can't even afford. Earthly bread are, can be so many different things that temporarily feed me but then make me hungry again. Worldly things. But Jesus wants me to hunger for things that are infinitely more satisfying. Things that he's providing for me. He wants to take me from thinking about simple milk that I was fed as an infant and now take me to a spiritual diet that is much more luxurious and much more satisfying. And that's the second point I want to focus on today. And that's spiritual growth. Jesus is trying to lead the crowd from a temporary bread and wine to his true body and blood. And that's, we see that progression in chapter 6. And in chapter 6, as I mentioned, it starts with Jesus feeding the multitudes, the feeding the 5,000. Next passage in chapter 6 is Jesus walking on the water. And then what we talk about today, Jesus declares, do not labor for the, or warns, do not labor for the food that perishes, but the food which endures to everlasting life. Next, he declares very importantly, I am the bread of life. Then finally he ends chapter 6 with, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Talking, of course, about eating his blood and body in, in the Eucharist. So you see that elevation to a deeper and deeper and higher spiritual meaning. But the crowd resists, and the crowd refuses to be led into this deeper, spiritual, a deeper spiritual understanding. And this actually results to a fr somewhat of a frustrating conversation. Jesus is talking about one thing, and the crowd is on a completely different page, on a completely different level, and they refuse to be taken along. Jesus wants to elevate the crowd into a deeper understanding. He wants them to grow spiritually. He wants them to take them to a higher level, but they resist. This is something that we also need to be very mindful of. And ask, each and every one of us needs to ask ourselves, am I growing spiritually? Or has there been, has there been little change in my spiritual life over the years? And this doesn't necessarily mean whether you are at a higher or low spiritual level. Regardless of your spiritual level, you need to be growing spiritually all the time, every day. And I can't take the spiritual growth of mine for granted. Because it doesn't happen by default. It doesn't happen by itself. Like physical growth. I grow physically as long as I eat and take, you know, take minimal care of my body. I will grow physically, but I will not grow spiritually unless I put a, a conscious effort that I grow spiritually. Have you watched a child grow? Any of us who have had children, who have children, you see a, a child grow and it's a wonderful development. You see a child who struggles to walk and they grow to, to an adult who's able to run and play sports and do, do amazing things. You see a child who struggles to even form a single word to, to a child who can recite poetry and write, even write books. A child who can't even eat by themselves grow to a child who who can not only eat cleanly, but make a, and cook a gourmet meal. It's a wonderful miracle that we see in front of us. And it happens with parental guidance, and you see the, 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 the child grow and work at it, and develop physically on their own. It takes time, it takes hard, hard, hard work, it takes practice. The child needs to practice to walk, and needs to practice eating, and needs to practice walking, all these things. And as I observed, there's, pro there's probably you know, very general characterization. There's two kinds of parents. There's parents who think their children are all brilliant and gifted and they're, and they're developing so fast and they're ahead of every child they've ever encountered in their lives and their kids are geniuses. And, they, and, and they're just amazed by every development their child makes. And there's another type of parent who fuss and worry and their child is not developing fast enough and how come they're not walking yet and how come they're not talking yet and how come they're not doing this and doing that. And, and they could never develop fast enough for what they expect their child to do. And their child continues and develops and does well. Are we paying that much attention to our children's spiritual development? Are we as, the, as worried about that as, as their other side of their, their physical development? How about our own spiritual development? Are we focused on that as much either? The harsh reality is if I'm not growing spiritually, that I'm stagnating, I'm regressing, I'm standing still or even going backwards. And there's many reasons why people don't develop and mature spiritually. One of the most, dear, most dangerous ones is a spiritual comfort zone. Where I think of myself, I know enough basics about the Bible. 
I go to church, I listen to sermons, I'm a good person, I do the right thing, I don't do very man, many bad things, and I'm, I'm just satisfied with myself and satisfied with my spiritual development. Because of that, I don't work at a getting a deeper and deeper spiritual development and a closer relationship with God. As I said before, I will grow physically without a conscious effort to grow physically, whether I want to or not. But just because I grow older doesn't mean I'm going to grow spiritually. Even in the passage today, Jesus warns the crowd and says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. That means that we not only have to labor for our food, but we also have to labor for our spiritual food, the important food that, that leads to everlasting life. I have to, I have to work for that. Even St. Paul described this as this compared spiritual growth to physical exercise that requires practice, it requires training, it requires sacrifice, it requires hard work every day, it requires a commitment on my part to grow spiritually. And to grow spiritually, I need to allow, that the, Holy, I need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in me. I have to commit my life to God's will. I have to separate myself from the temptations and distractions of the world. And how do I do this? Well, one of the most important steps is I need, to truly read, I need to read and truly understand and study the Word of God every day in the Bible. Contemplate on it and study and understand it. But that's not enough. I need to apply it to my life. I need to love the Word of God. I need to apply the Word of God to my life. I need to pray every day to God from my heart. Not a quick prayer just to, 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 to satisfy my conscience. I need to pray to God every day from my heart and spend some quiet time with God and listen to His Word and talk to Him. I have to have a correctable and teachable heart to allow God to correct me and teach me. I need to forgive others. I need to resolve conflicts with others and avoid relationships with others, relationships that are standing in the way between myself and God and my relationship with God. I need to confess my sins regularly so that I could move on from those sins and move forward spiritually and not stagnate. I need to take communion regularly because communion gives me strength and gives, gives me blessing, allows, gives me protection from this world. I also need to recognize the talents that God has given me and use these talents to serve Him and to serve His, His children. And very importantly, I need to trust that God is working in me and for my benefit and benefit of others around me. So two very important messages we learned from the, from the conversation that Jesus had with the, with the crowds today. First one is, I need to change my focus. I need to change my focus from earthly things to worldly things, to eternal things. I need to see God, not for what God can give me, for what, for, but for who God is, and approach Him for who He is. Secondly, I need to pay attention to my spiritual growth. I can't neglect it. Because as, if I'm standing still, I'm not growing spiritually every day, and I can't stand still. I need to get closer to God every day. And glory be to God forever. Amen.